we'll go ahead and kick it off. I um, want to thank Ginger for having me, and thanks to uh, Blue Yoga Studio for putting this on. It's a pretty cool thing. Um, you'll notice on some of my slides that you can donate to the, the fund here. Uh, it's for a scholarship fund. So um, if you want to donate to a good cause, you can watch this for free. Um, but they're putting on more events like this, and if you'd like to help support that, um, feel free to donate at PayPal. Uh, the email address is fremontblueyoga at gmail.com. Um, this was supposed to be an actually a live event. It was supposed to be taking place uh, in person, but obviously due to uh, extenuating circumstances, we can't do that. So we're going to make the best of it. It might not be ideal, but uh, let's face it, most of what we're having to deal with right now is not ideal. So we're going to have fun. We're going to have try to have, try to have a good time. I'll start off with a little bit of an introduction. Uh, my name is Josh Kidney, um, and I'm primarily motivated by two things. Um, the first is bettering myself. Um, I really enjoy testing myself and pushing myself physically and mentally, uh, and I try to do so on a regular basis. Um, and I also like testing my logic, finding flaws in my logic, finding flaws in just logic in general, and finding new and better ways to do things. Uh, so that's my first motivation. Number two is bettering others. Um, I really enjoy surrounding myself with people who want to make themselves better, uh, who are striving and pushing to make themselves better every day. If I can contribute to that, that's great. Um, I would say my sweet, uh, sweet spot is when I can do both at the same time. So uh, I'm a coach and it's one of my favorite things to do. One of the cool things about being a coach is that, you know, when you're coaching on a subject, um, not only do you get to help people learn and help people grow, but you actually get better at your own subject matter. So that's why I like events like this. Um, because, you know, as I'm speaking, as I'm teaching, I'm getting better at my subject matter and hopefully I'm going to give you guys something that you can walk away with and, and use in your own life to make yourselves better. So, um, in this pursuit of bettering myself and bettering others, I wear quite a few hats. Uh, I'm bald, so I have to wear hats. Um, so the first hat I would say is I'm a musician. So I play guitar for the Dylan Bloom band. Um, and we're one of the kind of the premier unsigned country acts here in the Midwest. We play about 100 shows a year. Um, this picture was actually at the Sarpy County Fair last summer. Uh, we're facing about 5,000 people in that picture. And, uh, you know, hopefully, I think we're booked to play the Sarpy County Fair again. Hopefully that happens. Hopefully we can get to back to where we are um, playing in front of big groups of people and being able to come together as communities again. So um, outside of playing music, I'm an author. So I've written a couple books. These two are um, middle grade books. They're for kids between the ages of third grade and well, probably junior high. But I found out that uh, adults actually kind of enjoy these books as well. Um, I've written a book on music theory. I'll talk a little bit on that a little bit later. Um, and then most recently I've written uh, uh, my first adult novel. So that will be coming out later this year. I'm currently in the editing process of that. So uh, hopefully we'll be seeing that soon. Outside of writing, uh, I'm a podcaster. So me and my coach, Mick Doyle, we started a podcast, The Gentleman Badass Podcast. And on that podcast, we interview people from all walks of life who embody the warrior ethos. Um, and so we try to interview them and get tips and tricks of what they're doing in their lives so that we can hopefully steal those same ideas and use it in our lives to make our lives better. Um, and then finally, uh, I'm a coach and I am a jujitsu practitioner. I've been training jiu-jitsu for about nine years, and it's one of my biggest passions, and it's actually one of uh, the primary focus of this talk today. Now, I'm going to be talking about jiu-jitsu uh, and mostly the principles that I've learned from jiu-jitsu. I'm hoping that I can teach you some principles that I've learned that you can use in your own life. Um, even if you don't ever want to train jiu-jitsu, have no aspirations of training jiu-jitsu, I'm hoping that the principles I've learned can, can benefit anybody in their life. So, um, but before I get into that, I do want to give you some insight into what jujitsu is. So, what is jujitsu? I think this uh, meme kind of sums it up. Jujitsu is the gentle art of folding clothes while people are still in them, or involuntary yoga. So, I think it's kind of suiting that we're in a yoga studio here, uh, a blue yoga studio in Fremont. Um, and imagine, imagine if you will, you're doing a nice relaxing yoga workout and you're in the happy baby pose. And then all of a sudden someone jumps on top of you and tries to choke you uh, and or break your arm. Uh, that gives you an idea of what jujitsu is. Um, so uh, jujitsu we call the gentle arts. And we do that for a number of reasons. One is there's no striking in jujitsu. So boxing and kickboxing, there's, there's blunt force trauma. They're striking in jujitsu. It's a grappling based martial arts. So we're wrestling around on the ground. 
The, the goal of jiu-jitsu is to try to wrestle your competition into a position where they can't escape, and generally these positions are going to be where you could cause grave danger, grave harm to them if you were to follow through on the position. Well, we call it the gentle art because we give our opponents the ability to tap out. So if you ever are doing jiu-jitsu, you find yourself in a position that's too uncomfortable, you physically tap your opponent, they let go, you both stand up, you both walk away unharmed. Um, so jiu-jitsu is, is actually safe for people to train of all ages. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, but what does it look like? So what would potentially training jiu-jitsu and folding clothes with people still in them, what does that look like? Well, this is a good idea. Um, so this is a jiu-jitsu competition. Um, and in this competition, basically the guy in blue, he's trying to pull off what's called a bow and arrow choke. So um, this is jiu-jitsu kind of at its extreme, right? Uh, a, a practice isn't gonna look like this extreme. Um, if you go to a practice, you're gonna see a lot of people smiling, a lot of people having a good time, having good conversations, having good fun. Um, but jiu-jitsu is also a self-defense, a form of self-defense, okay? So in this instance, let's say the guy's trying to pull off this bow and arrow choke, the guy in white decides he's had enough, he, he can't take it anymore, he physically taps his opponent, the referee stops the match, and the guy in blue lets go, they stand up, they both walk away unharmed, okay? Uh, on the other hand, let's say the guy in white decides he can take a little bit more. Let's say he's gonna try to fight it as hard as possible. Well, if that choke is synced in uh, properly, um, what's gonna happen is he's gonna go to sleep. He's literally gonna be choked unconscious. The blood flow is gonna be cut off from his brain, it's gonna shut his brain off, and he's physically gonna go to sleep. If that is the case, it sounds quite awful. Um, I've been put to sleep before, it's really not that bad. Um, but in that case, if that happens, the referee stops the match, they both stand up, they wake up the guy in white, he's probably a little confused, but you know, not really harmed, and then they walk away, ready to train again, and compete again uh, another day. Um, so, a gentle art, right? And also a self-defense system. Now, jiu-jitsu was developed to be a self-defense system and a fighting system for a smaller opponent to overcome a larger opponent. Now, the founder of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a guy named Helio Gracie, and Helio Gracie was a small man. He weighed about 120 pounds. Um, I've seen videos of him grappling, and he'd only come about that high on me. So, tiny guy, he needed to find a, a fighting system where he could potentially overcome a larger opponent. Thus, we have Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So, this works great as a, a self-defense system for women. Um, let's say, uh, specifically, a woman is being attacked by a man who is larger than her. If she can grapple, if she can wrestle her way to a position where we, she can choke that man, that attacker, unconscious, um, it's going to give her plenty of time to stand up and run away. So, I highly encourage women to take up self-defense. Not only is it fun, but it's a great, great way to uh, protect yourself in certain situations. So, all that said, Jiu-Jitsu is a gentle art. Uh, this is what I looked like after the first couple weeks of training jiu-jitsu. Um, not sure if you can see that well on the screen. Um, that's a picture of me, and I have about two dozen bruises all over my body. Um, you know, despite kind of the initial growing pains, the initial kind of your body getting used to jiu-jitsu and, and movements it's not normally used to doing, um, jiu-jitsu, like I said, is safe for people of all ages. And, and a good example is that Anthony Bourdain, began training jiu-jitsu in his late 50s. Um, and he actually continued training, trained regularly uh, up until his death in his mid 60s. Um, and then I mentioned Helio Gracie before. This is a picture of Helio Gracie training probably around 2009. Um, he trained until the day he died, basically until the day he died at the age of 95. So if you're interested in learning jiu-jitsu, don't let age, don't let physical ability, don't let anything get you in the way. There's a spot for you and we would love to have you. So, um, with that said, Jiu-Jitsu being a gentle art, one that's safe, one that is a good self-defense system, um, a lot of people train. It's grown exponentially over the last several years. I started nine years ago, and I thought I was behind the curve, and it has at least doubled in size since I started. So, uh, not only that, not only are normal people training, uh, there's a lot of celebrities training. So, for example, this is Ed O'Neill. You might recognize him from Modern Family. Um, he's been training for a long, long time. He's a black belt, and he's been training since people knew him better as Al Bundy. Um, Kate Upton. Kate Upton's a supermodel, and she trains regularly. Obviously, being a supermodel, she can't really be doing things that could potentially disfigure her. Um, so once again, it proves jiu-jitsu is, is safe for everyone. Um, Vince Vaughn. Vince Vaughn trains regularly. Uh, Ashton Kutcher. 
Ashton Kutcher is a brown belt. Uh, he trains heavily, and I've seen some videos, videos of him grappling, and uh, he knows a thing or two. Um, Demi Lovato, you may recognize her from singing the, uh, the national anthem for this year's uh, Super Bowl, Go Chiefs. Um, but she's a blue belt. She trains regularly, and it's a big part of her life. Of course, um, Keanu Reeves. Keanu's been training uh, for a while. If you've seen any of the John Wick movies, you'll have seen some of his jujitsu on display. And then um, Noah, uh, what's his name? His name's blanking on me right now, but he used to be overweight. I think you'll recognize him from Superbad. And uh, yeah, he didn't necessarily use jujitsu to lose the weight, but he's certainly using it nowadays to keep it off. So, um, and then last but not certainly not least is the man himself, Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris trains and he is a third degree black belt in jiu-jitsu. So if jiu-jitsu is important enough for Chuck Norris to learn, it's probably uh, important enough for you to learn. And consequently, did you hear um, Chuck Norris was actually exposed to the coronavirus? Um, yeah, they actually had to quarantine the virus. Uh, it was afraid that it may uh, test positive for Chuck Norris. So, sorry, bad joke, but uh, so anyway, that's kind of jujitsu. That's the sports of jujitsu and the martial art of jujitsu. Um, so I want to get into some of the principles that I have learned um, from training jujitsu. So the first one, and one of my uh, favorites, one of the most important, I think, is to develop a growth mindset. So um, for those who don't know, there are two basic types of mindsets. There's a growth mindset and there's a fixed mindset. So People with a fixed mindset, they believe that they're either good at something or they're not. They believe that failure is the limit of their abilities. And they believe that abilities are unchanging. Um, so people with a fixed mindset generally aren't going to like challenges, right? If you challenge yourself, there's a potential for failure. And if failure is basically the limit of your abilities, why test that boundary, right? Might as well, might as well stay away from that boundary as far as possible. Um, because of this, people with a fixed mindset generally don't try, like trying new things and they don't like feedback or criticism because, you know, once again, it's kind of pointing out failures and they don't like failures. Uh, people with a growth mindset, on the other hand, believe that they can learn uh, anything they want to learn. They believe that failure is an opportunity to grow and they believe effort and attitude determine abilities. So people with a growth mindset are going to be open to challenges. They know that challenging themselves is an opportunity to grow. And even if they fail in their challenge, uh, the failure is another opportunity to grow. And so um, people with a, with a growth mindset are probably going to be more likely to try new things. And they're also going to be more open to feedback and uh, criticism because they know that's kind of pointing out maybe shortcomings that they have and shortcomings that they can shore up and, and grow and learn from. So um, I would say I kind of developed a growth mindset a little bit earlier in my life. And I, I kind of learned by playing guitar and learning how to play guitar. So the thing with guitar is nobody can start guitar and be immediately good. Um, there's some people who learn a little bit faster than others, but for the most part, when you pick up a guitar, you're going to be terrible. It's going to be painful. It's going to hurt your fingers. You're going to feel like you're bad. It's going to take forever to feel like you're getting any good. Um, not to mention it's painful for everybody that has to listen to you practice, right? My parents were saints for putting up with me practicing. I was kind of a, a loner and a nerd in high school, so I practiced, I literally practiced guitar probably six to eight hours a day, and they had to listen to it all. Absolute sense, I can't thank them enough for letting me do that. Um, but through this learning guitar, um, before that, whenever I ran into something that was kind of difficult, something that was challenging, uh, I would generally quit. As soon as it got, as soon as it was hard, as soon as it got too tough, I would quit and I would leave. Well, with guitar, I found this thing that even though it was hard, I, I realized I wanted to do whatever I could to try to learn it. And I realized that I could use that same type of mindset in everything in life. Okay. Um, so learning guitar kind of helped me develop that growth mindset. And I was able to use that in, in other areas of my life. Well, you know, as often happens, life threw me a curveball. Um, I had started a band kind of in college and we had some success. We got a, a booking and management deal out of Nashville. We started touring around the country and, and I was living my dream. Uh, but then it all fell apart. The band broke up. I had to go back to work and get a job I didn't like. Um, and I just found myself in a rut. I was, I was just sad and I was miserable with my life. And I found myself falling back into a fixed mindset. I found myself um, finding that where if something got hard, I just quit. I didn't stick with anything. Um, so a couple years went by. I turned 29 and I realized 
I'm overweight, I'm out of shape, and I'm just miserable with my life. And I realized I didn't want to turn 30 and feel the same way that I was feeling at the age of 29. And so I decided to make some changes. The first thing I did was lose weight. Um, and once I'd lost some weight, I decided, well, I need to get in shape. So uh, I went to Mick Doyle's gym because I heard it was the hardest workout in Omaha. So when I got to Mix, I signed up with a trainer and the trainer told me, he said, hey, since you're training with me, you actually get access to all of our classes. And so why don't you come back tonight and try jujitsu? And I thought, oh, okay. I mean, I've watched the UFC. I thought it was pretty cool. I mean, how hard could it be? Um, well, I was wrong. I showed up to class that night and uh, we did our, our normal, normal kind of class. We learned some techniques. And then at the end, we do what's called rolling. Um, in jiu-jitsu, rolling is kind of the term for sparring. It's like light fighting. We're practicing fighting. It's, it's fun, but it's also challenging. And, and it's, it's kind of like a, a fight at 50%, if you will. So Mick at the time was coaching that class. And uh, he looked at me and he said, how much do you weigh? I said, uh, 180 pounds. And then he looked at this kid across the room who was probably 16 year old, years old and just scrawny. He said, hey, how much do you weigh? And this kid's like 90 pounds. He said, you two go together. So we go out to the middle of the mat, kind of tie up, and this, uh, this kid who was literally half my age and half my weight um, basically kicked my ass, right? He, he mopped the floor with me. And this is a turning point in a lot of people's lives, right? Especially for men. Men like to think that they are tough. They, they like to think that if it came down to it and if they had to fight, that they could fight and they could win. Well, jujitsu basically exposes that, that weakness. And uh, it exposed it in me, absolutely. And so one of two things generally happens. The first is uh, people will say, man, that was hard. That was scary. That was uncomfortable. I don't ever want to feel like that again. I'm going to do whatever I can to avoid that, that feeling ever again. So that's the first kind of direction people go. The second direction is people say, wow, that was hard. That was uncomfortable. That was scary. I don't ever want to feel like that again. Um, I need to learn that martial art. And that's kind of the camp that I fell into. I realized that, man, I need to learn this. And so I started, I started practicing, I started training. I trained pretty much every night. And then I started training every morning and every night. And then I started comp competing and then I started teaching. And it just kind of, you know, it, it grew and, and expounded from there. And what I found was it helped me kind of redevelop. It reignited that growth mindset in me. And it made me realize that, you know, jiu-jitsu, this is hard. It was the hardest thing I'd ever done. And so the fact that I was able to, to do that and overcome it, it made me realize that I could, uh, I could do other challenges. I could overcome other things in my life. And so from then on out, um, jiu-jitsu kind of helped me develop the courage to, to take on bigger challenges. And one of those challenges was to quit the job that I didn't like. And so a couple years down the road, uh, I ended up leaving that job. I'll talk a little bit about that in the next principle because it, it kind of clued me into something else. But, um, you know, from there, I was able to, to redevelop that growth mindset. So, you know, what about you? What if you're not interested in jujitsu? Um, what can you do to, to, to develop a growth mindset? Well, um, there's a couple different things that, that we can talk about in developing a growth mindset. The first is, the first step that you can take if you're interested in doing it is to find something you really want to learn and uh, that's really hard, okay? So find something that's really hard that you would like to learn. Um, and what's kind of cool to think about right now is, is, is actually in our current situation where we're kind of stuck at home, there may be no better time than now to find something hard that you want to learn, okay? So um, obviously it's not ideal that we're all locked inside our houses, but if we can make the best of it, uh, maybe we can emerge stronger than when we went in. Um, so if you're kind of maybe wondering what types of things can I try to learn now that I'm locked at home, I've got a couple suggestions for you that are uh, in no way related to jiu-jitsu or music. One is um, coding, right? Learning how to code on a computer. It can be one of the, the most valuable skills you ever learn. And learning is, is free under, in so many different ways. So one opportunity is through codecademy.com. Um, it's a free website and you can go on and you can learn a number of coding languages. See if it's something that you like, see if it's something that you could potentially learn. You can put on your own coding boot camp while you're locked at home, potentially emerge from this thing with new skills where you can go get a new career. Um, another option is udemy.com. So Udemy is an account, uh, is a website where they have a bunch of different options um, of, of classes. There's, there's hundreds, potentially thousands of different subjects that you can take classes on. Now, the thing with Udemy is you're gonna go to the website and you're gonna see that these courses cost maybe $100 or $200 a piece. Don't be intimidated by that. Sign up for an account and find the courses that you're interested in and put them in your shopping cart 
and then leave. Um, basically what will happen is Udemy will see those there and they have sales very regularly where they put all of their, their classes on sale for $10 a piece. Uh, or they may even say, send you an email and say, hey, you know, are you inter still interested in taking this class? If so, it's $10. Um, I've taken classes on Photoshop, I've taken classes on video editing, on writing, um, tons of different things, and I've gotten all my classes for, for $10. And these, some of these classes were classes that are actually four and $500 classes. So Udemy is a great resource for learning um, now that we've got a little time to learn. Another option is freecodecamp.com. Uh, this is really unique in that it, it, it aggregates a bunch of free uh, online courses from Ivy League schools. So you could take an online course um, that was put out by Harvard or one that was put out by Stanford or, or Yale, and they're all free. So uh, a wonderful opportunity to learn. And then one that's just one of my favorites is omahalibrary.org or whatever your local library is. Um, Omaha uh, has a great library. There's a lot of different branches. Um, if you can't get out of your house and go physically check out a book, um, there's an app called Libby that will give you access to books that you can read and then also audiobooks. So check that out. Get yourself a, an account. It's free um, and it's completely worthwhile. So um, once again, that's the, the first thing to kind of look at is find something that you really want to learn. It's really hard. Number two, uh, the second step in developing a growth mindset is to decide that you're going to learn it no matter the difficulty. Don't let laziness, don't let distraction get in your way. Um, we'll talk about kind of uh, a little bit later in this talk how to figure out whether you're on the right path, but you may be on the right path and you might end up just finding laziness or distraction get in your way. Don't let those things happen. Um, make your best efforts to learn. Once we kind of get out of the slump where we can get out of our house, you know, the opportunity of potentially, you know, getting a coach, taking lessons, um, getting books and studying, maybe you have to watch a little bit less TV at night to learn, um, it's all going to be worth it. So make your best efforts to learn. And then the final step uh, is to fail fast and fail often. You're going to find some of your most, some of your biggest growth in your failures. Um, and that's actually the next step or the next principle that I'm going to talk about is uh, investing in failure. So investing in failure uh, is a phrase that was developed by or put together by a guy named Josh Waitzkin. Now, Josh Waitzkin was the basis for the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer. Um, Josh Waitzkin was a child chess prodigy, and uh, he ended up being a world champion in, in chess. And then he kind of retired from chess and took up martial arts, and he ended up being a two-time world champion uh, Tai Chi push hands competitor. Um, tai Chi push hands is similar to judo. Uh, it's about the best comparison that I know. Um, and then he actually switched from Tai Chi push hands to Jiu Jitsu. Uh, and he started training Jiu Jitsu and he became the first black belt under Marcelo Garcia. And Marcelo Garcia is probably one of the best, so not probably, he is one of the best, if not the best grappler uh, to ever walk the earth. Um, so Josh Waitzkin came up with this term, invest in failure in his book, um, The Art of Learning. So what does that mean? Well, if we look at Jiu Jitsu, um, we call jiu-jitsu a gentle art. It's a gentle art because we allow our opponents to tap out um, before we cause them any, any damage. And what this does is it makes it a gentle art because failure um, isn't, isn't severe, right? You can fail. I can go to a jiu-jitsu class and I can get, to, get tapped out 20 times and still walk out just fine, right? It's a gentle enough art that I regularly practice about two to three hours a day. Um, on the other hand, martial arts like boxing is, is not a gentle art. Um, boxing and kickboxing are violent arts. Um, so Mick Doyle, my coach, has a saying. Uh, he says, if you get submitted in a jiu-jitsu match, um, you're probably going to you know, tap out and then smile and turn to your opponent and say, hey, that was cool, how did you do that? Um, on the other hand, if you are in a boxing match or a kickboxing match and you lose, um, very likely you're gonna be waking up on the floor asking your coach which ha what happened because you got knocked out. Um, so uh, what's crazy is in boxing, even if you win, you can still take a lot of damage. Um, so for example, this is a picture of Tyson Fury. And obviously by the belt over his shoulder, he won that fight, but his face tells a different story. And believe it or not, this is one of the tamer photos I could find online. I know, you know some people watching this might not be accustomed to the violence that we see in martial arts and in combat sports. Um, but you know, if you really wanna see some uh, some gritty photos, go ahead and Google boxing damage and you'll see some, some pretty intense um, visions of what failure can look like. So in jiu-jitsu, that's not the case. Jiu-jitsu is a gentle art. And so 
Um, the thing with, with tapping out is tapping out is not the goal. We don't go into a role and with the goal uh, of tapping out. On the other hand, tapping out is inve- in, inevitable. Failure is inevitable. Um, even the best grapplers in the world have probably tapped out hundreds to thousands of times in their career. And the thing is, is that's okay, okay? One of the metrics that you can use to gauge whether or not you're learning jujitsu is um, how often you're tapping out. So let's, see it, let's say me and my buddy start training jujitsu together and we only ever trade together. Uh, we only ever train together. Well, eventually, you know, we're gonna learn a little bit, but our, li- our learning is going to be limited. Um, because eventually I'm going to see everything that he can throw at me. He's going to see everything that I can throw at him. And we're both going to start tapping out less. The, what we can do to um, kind of grow our learning or, or to increase our learning is start to roll and start to train with people who are of a higher skill level, right? So I'm not getting tapped out by my friend who knows the same as me. Then I roll with somebody who has more experience and all of a sudden I'm getting tapped out more, right? I'm failing more. But what's crazy is every time you tap out, it's a lesson and something that doesn't work. It's a technique that doesn't work. Um, and once you learn, uh, maybe over a couple, you know, couple repetitions of, of losing to that same thing, once you learn what doesn't work, you can avoid it. And so that's why you end up tapping out less. Well, when you start moving on to um, tougher opponents, more skilled opponents, well, they're gonna throw uh, more complicated submissions at you. And so you're gonna start tapping out more. But in this, you're actually learning more complicated lessons in things that don't work. And so when you learn those lessons, eventually you learn to avoid them and you keep kind of growing. Uh, You keep growing as a a martial artist. Um, And we can actually translate this to to pretty much anything in life. And the way I like to look at it is kind of like a wheel. I like to think of this process as a wheel that is rolling up a hill, right? So the first step that we talk about is to expose ourselves to a difficult challenge, right? We need to we need to go train with that person that knows more than we do. We need to be we need to challenge ourselves to the point where we may fail. And in that event, it's very likely that we will fail, okay? But failure is not the end of the road, it's the beginning. And from there, we can learn to overcome, learn and overcome from that failure, right? Once we've kind of learned that lesson, then we can repeat the cycle. We can challenge us find a new challenge that's that's more difficult and we can challenge with ourselves ourselves with that we can fail again and we can keep that process going and like i said it's kind of like a wheel that rolls up the hill eventually um, the failures of the past are are basically afterthoughts they're not even things you need to think about anymore because you're so good at even more complicated systems so i like to think of that once again as a wheel rolling up a hill and and constantly you know if you're not failing you're probably not trying hard enough so um, how does this apply outside of jiu-jitsu Um, Let's take entrepreneurship. So I talked about quitting my job to start my own business and uh, ultimately that business failed Um, But you know, I ended up it ended up being kind of a gentle art Uh, That failure was gentle versus a violent art uh, like boxing. So To explain this there's a there's an entrepreneur that I like to follow his name is Naval Ravikant So Naval Ravikant is an entrepreneur um, But he is also an angel investor and so he works with other startups um, investing in them and helping them grow in, in hopes of making money. And he's got three rules for keeping, um, uh, for failure when it comes to entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, it's keeping failure as a gentle art like jujitsu. The first rule is don't lose all your money. So when I failed with my first business, um, thankfully it was a cash business. I was able to start the business with cash I had. I didn't end up losing money. I just wasn't profitable enough over the long run to keep it going. Um, On the other hand, you know, if I would have leveraged my house, if I would have taken out a bunch of loans, then if I would have failed, it would have been a lot worse than just a learning experience. It could have potentially, you know, made a a large impact on my life, potentially one that I couldn't recover from. So the first lesson in in keeping entrepreneurship as a a gentle art is uh, don't lose all your money. The second is pretty simple, um, pretty basic. Don't go to jail. (laughs) <laughs> you know, we want to be ethical. We want to be upstanding in everything that we're doing. Um, there's a, a saying kind of in the fight community is you don't really know someone until you've fought them. And it's actually very true, right? There might be someone standing in front of you who you think is cool, calm and collected. But as soon as kind of they, they're in the, the thick of it, they're in that fight, uh, all of a sudden their, their coolness, their calmness, it disappears. There might be someone you think is, you know, kind of uh, honest and upstanding and you get them in a fight and they start to lose and all of a sudden they're pulling out dirty tricks and they're, you know, they're gouging your eyes and trying to do things to win that, that, you know, aren't upstanding. They're not uh, ethical. 
Um, and so pretty simple, but don't go to jail, right? That can leave lasting imp implications on your life. It can ruin your life. Um, third, don't damage your reputation. Um, I think this is probably one of the reasons a lot of people don't step out and, and take um, challenges, uh, try new challenges. They're afraid that if they fail, people are going to think less of them. Um, and while it's true that some people may look at your failure um, and think less of you, these people, I, I really don't value the opinion of these people. These, these people don't understand how real life works. Um, you know, if you kind of follow the other rules of don't lose all your money, don't go to jail, if you're being ethical, if you're really giving it your best shots, uh, the people that matter aren't going to care that you fail. They're going to be forgiving. Okay. So three simple rules. Uh, don't lose your money. Don't go to jail. Don't damage your reputation. That's how we can kind of keep entrepreneurship, uh, as a gentle art. So, um, other areas of our life, how can we invest in failure? It's pretty simple. One, if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. Um, find something that's challenging, push yourself to get better. Um, push yourself to where you eventually fail, learn and grow from that failure. Two, once again, overcome and learn from your failures. Um, their growth, their opportunities for growth, okay? Um, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So basically, um, what we're kind of running into right now um, is, is a major failure, kind of as a country. You know, obviously this pandemic is, is something that's scary because it, it can affect our health. But um, I also think it's just super uncomfortable because we just did not see it coming, right? It's kind of, it kind of feels like a major failure as a country and potentially a major failure as individuals. And so as uncomfortable and as not great a situation it is, um, hopefully we can, we can take some lessons and learn from this. So what lessons can we learn from? Um, well, I mean, financially, let's think of an emergency fund. Um, you know, it doesn't take a global pandemic to potentially make your job disappear. You know, it's just wise in general to have some money set aside, if at all possible for, you know, do you have, could you live for a month without a job? What about six months without a job? Building up that emergency fund is something that can help in, in multiple situations. So if that's something that you're struggling with right now, um, I hope things turn out okay, but also use it as an opportunity to learn so that it doesn't happen again. Um, emergency rations, right? We we like to make fun of the preppers who, who um, who you know put bunkers in their backyard and, and underground or who have years worth of food stocked up well that's a little little crazy but you know is having an extra week worth of water or a week's worth of food uh, a bad idea i mean we live in nebraska we i mean let's think of the weather over the last couple days we yesterday we had thunderstorms and hail potential tornadoes and then today we have snow right the idea of something happening where we're isolated at home or where we lose power or we lose you know something that we're used to having um, that's not uncommon. So having some emergency rations in place is not a bad idea. Um, what about health? Um, so, you know, one of the things that makes a pandemic scary is it affects our health. Well, um, there's certain things about our health that we can control and there's certain things that we can't control. And, um, you know, the, the rule is control what you control. You can control, um, your health, the healthier that you are, the more likely you'll be able to withstand something like this. And so, you know, if, if you found yourself kind of slacking in the health department, let's use this as an opportunity to, to pick it up and, and get healthy again. Okay. Uh, and then finally investment opportunities. I'm not going to lie. It has, has absolutely sucked watching my retirement accounts drop by 30% over the last month or so. But as an investor, I know that, you know, this isn't just uh, possible, it's probable. This isn't the first time it's happened. It's not going to be the last time it's happened. So if you can prepare knowing that this is a possibility, you can actually use things like this to, to capitalize uh, on, on bad market conditions, right? You know, everybody, whenever I get that coupon in the mail from Kohl's that says 30% off, I'm like, great, I'm going to go buy me some clothes. But the same thing happens in the stock market and stocks go on sale for 30%. People freak out and they run for the hills, right? If we've got a little extra cash or if we purposely set aside some cash in our investment accounts so that we can invest in a time like this, we may be able to capitalize. Um, if you think about the last financial crisis, the market went down to about 6,000 points. Even today where it closed, uh, it closed at about 20,000 points, which is a 300% gain over what it closed at last time. And if we look at where the market was a couple, uh, two months ago, we're looking at like a 500% gain, right? So um, the market's down, it sucks. I hate seeing myself lose money, but it's an opportunity to potentially capitalize. So take this opportunity. It's, it's an unfortunate event that we're, we're dealing with right now, but we can learn from it and we can grow from it, okay? Um, 
So the final one is to seek out uh, new failures to overcome, okay? And this kind of leads into the next principle. Um, if, if we're finding things are a little bit too easy, let's figure out a way to make them harder and so that we learn more. And we can do that by experimenting, okay? Let me sip here real quick. So there is a, uh, there's an entrepreneur, another entrepreneur that I follow named uh, Derek Sivers. And he put out a video on YouTube a while back and it had a line that really made me, um, it really stuck out to me. It was, it was really valuable. And the line was, there's no such thing as failure if everything is an experiment. So I'll say that again, there's no such thing as failure if everything is an experiment. So um, you may not agree with that, especially if you didn't agree with what I just talked about uh, with failure, but um, Derek actually kind of goes on to explain it a little bit further in a blog post. So in this blog post, he says, uh, everything usually feels so serious. Like if you make one mistake, it'll all end in disaster. But really, everything you do is just a test and a, an experiment to see what happens. My favorite times in life started with a see what happens approach. Uh, let's see what happens if I run my vocals through my guitar pedals. Let's see what happens if I invite that famous producer to lunch. Let's see what happens if I call that radio station to ask their advice. It's actually impossible to fail uh, if your only mission is to see what happens. Um, there is no downside, try everything. Now, when we, we're talking about no downside, try everything, obviously we've got to keep our three rules in mind. We don't want to lose all our money, we don't want to go to jail, and we don't want to damage our reputation, right? Trying meth is probably a bad idea. Trying crack cocaine is probably a bad idea. Outside of that, if we're following those rules, um, we can really turn life into a grand experiment, a grand playground, if you will. Um, there's another entrepreneur who had similar feelings you probably be rec uh, you probably recognize him, uh, Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison said, "I haven't failed. I've just found ten thousand ways that won't work." Um, as we mentioned before, tapping out in jujitsu is finding one way that doesn't work. Um, what if Thomas Edison stopped after his thousandth failed experiment? What if he stopped after two thousand failed experiments? What would have happened? Someone would have eventually invented the light bulb, but it wouldn't have been Thomas Edison. Um, and so. Um, we can kind of keep this in mind with, with jujitsu, like we talked about, um, there's a couple different ways to get better and, uh, experimenting comes in is a, is a big, um, point for that. So one way we can experiment in jujitsu and make things a little bit harder for us to learn is to practice with our eyes closed or to roll with our eyes closed. So can I win a fight? Can I literally win a fight with my eyes closed? Um, and what you'll learn is when you're doing jujitsu with your eyes closed, you're going to learn some things that you wouldn't have learned otherwise. Uh, another experiment that we can do is, you know, can I win, a, a, can I grab my belt and can I win a fight with no hands, right? Could I, could I win a, a fight with my hands tied behind my back? You know, if I'm fighting with my hands tied behind my back, I'm going to run into some situations that I wouldn't run into otherwise. Um, it's going to teach me that there's, there's other weapons that I can pull in my legs and my elbows and things like that. Um, one of the basically one of the primary ways that, that we use to experiment is is really just handicapping ourselves in general. So, you know, I've been training for quite a while. I've got some experience. If I'm rolling with someone who doesn't have as much experience as me, it's possible possible for me to just smash them, right? I can just ground them into the mat and and make them look like they don't know a thing. Um, the problem with that is they don't learn anything from that and I don't learn anything from that. So, so what can I do as someone with more experience rolling with someone with less experience? Well, um, I can purposely handicap myself. I can grapple with them lightly until they put me in a bad position. Then not only do you have the opportunity to learn and potentially tap me out, um, uh, I'm also learning and have to escape, right? Since I'm not afraid of tapping out, I'm also not afraid of, I don't have an ego that's going to get in the way of me tapping out to a white belt. So when I put myself in a bad position for them to potentially tap me out, um, they're learning, right? And I'm learning. So, um, it's a great way to, 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 to learn. And we can use this in other areas of our life. So how can we think about experimenting with our lives and how can we be effective at experimenting? So, uh, the first, kind of directive I would say is find something to learn that will benefit you even if you don't achieve your intended outcome. Uh, so back in 2015, I decided I wanted to be a vlogger, a video blogger. I'd seen Casey Neistat on YouTube and it looked like he was making some good money and having fun. And, you know, I thought, well, 
you know, I'm a, I play in a band, I tour all over the place. Uh, I've got my own business. I train jiu-jitsu all the time. Like my life is kind of interesting. I think maybe people would want to watch. And so I made a goal to record 30 videos in 30 days uh, and put them all on YouTube. And what I found in the process is I really don't like vlogging. Um, I prefer to live life in the moment and to actually take part rather than having a camera up and trying to record everything and catch, catch those moments. Um, but in the process of putting 30 videos on YouTube, I actually learned how to edit video using Adobe Premiere. And that has been a skill that has served me uh, up, uh, since then. So with the podcast, I'm editing, vi editing videos constantly. I'm uh, editing videos for my wife. Uh, for her real estate business, I'm editing videos for random people who decide they needed a video editing. And that all started because of, of an experiment that technically failed, right? So another experiment is the podcast, the Gentleman Badass podcast. So when I was thinking of putting this podcast together, I actually kind of had two goals for it. The first goal was to get better as a conversationalist. So I'm an introvert and, and conversations are difficult for me. So I knew I needed to practice. I knew I needed to get better. And what better situation to do that than is, you know, uh, with, a, with a guest where I'm forced to ask questions, where I'm forced to, to start a conversation and keep a conversation go, going. And not only that, but I'm being recorded. And so I can go back and listen to how terrible I was or the things that I did right. And I can use that to fix uh, what I need to do moving forward. Um, the second goal for the podcast was I wanted to gain access to people I wouldn't otherwise have access to, um, potentially semi-famous people that you know might be willing to you know do a, an interview for a podcast, but wouldn't be willing to just sit down and talk to me on the phone for an hour. And that has actually been uh, greatly beneficial. It's kind of far outweighed my expectations of what's happened. So, for one example, um, uh, we got to interview a guy named Tom Shea. So Tom Shea uh, is a, was a Navy SEAL. He was a Navy SEAL sniper, uh, and he was also a Navy SEAL sniper instructor. He was actually Chris Kyle's sniper instructor. If you saw the movie American Sniper, um, that was based on Chris Kyle, uh, and Tom Shea was his, his uh, instructor. Well, uh, Tom Shea also wrote a book that had a big impact on, on my life, and pretty much two years to the day after I read that book, uh, Mick and I were able to sit down and interview Tom Shea for an hour over Skype, which is an opportunity I never would have had without the podcast. Um, another awesome interview that we got to do is with a guy named Owen Roddy. So Owen is Conor McGregor's striking coach, and Owen was one of three people who was in the corner, in Conor McGregor's corner for the Conor uh, McGregor Mayweather fight, which was the biggest boxing match in history. Um, so, I mean, how on earth would a guy from small town Nebraska ever get the opportunity to, to interview a guy who's in the corner of the biggest mo boxing match in history? With a podcast, with mixed connections, we were able to sit down and interview uh, Owen over Skype um, and learn some really awesome lessons from him. So, that's the first goal is to find something to learn that will benefit you even if you don't achieve your intended outcome. Even if we never make lots of money using this podcast, it's already already been an overwhelming success, you know, helping me learn conversations and then also the people that I've gotten interview. We just released our 25th interview and we've got probably five or six more in the bank that we can inter or that we'll be releasing shortly. So, number 2, don't spend a lot of money. Um, when you get into learning something new, something's new and exciting, it's very tempting to go out and spend a bunch of money on gear and on the new things that you think might make you good at that thing. Um, I was really bad at this. Um, it's very tempting to, to go out and just, and just buy the cool things. So, uh, for example, right now uh, I'm learning archery. Um, but I'm not sure if it's something I'm going to stick with. I don't know if I have enough time. I'm not sure if I'm going to really enjoy it. So even though it's tempting to go to Bass Pro and buy a you know a thousand dollar bow and and a bunch of expensive arrows, I'm borrowing one from a friend. Right? He's got an old one. He's willing to let me use it, and it's potential. Uh, it's certainly enough to to help me learn and help me realize if I'm going to like it and stick with it or not. Um, so with with the uh, with the archery. Um, I don't actually know what I need. So if I were to go out right now and buy a thousand dollar bow, I might be wasting a thousand dollars on something that I may never use. Um, you know, in my areas of expertise, like in jujitsu, it's not uncommon to see a white belt walk in the door with a $300 uh, kimono, a $300 gi, um, when a $50 one would suit them. For guitar, it's not uncommon for uh, me to see a brand new guitar player playing a $3,000 guitar. 
Here's a clue, a $3,000 guitar isn't gonna make you a, a better guitar player. The guitar that I learned on was free, I got from a friend. So spending the money up front is, is usually a bad idea. I kind of have a maxim that I stick with and it's uh, get good with the minimum and upgrade to the premium. So get good with the minimum, upgrade to the premium. That's gonna give you an idea of what you actually need, what, what's gonna work for you. Um, if you end up quitting early on, uh, you're not gonna have a bunch of money that you wasted on something that you're never gonna use. Um, and then the final key point is keep your experiment to yourself. Now this one seems kind of counterintuitive, but it's actually, uh, it will help you succeed. So um, I was really bad at this back in the day. Whenever I decided I was gonna learn something new, um, I would kind of blab to all my friends that, hey, I'm gonna do this, hey, I'm gonna do this. And uh, the problem with that is every time you tell someone about your goal, something that you're trying to achieve, it gives your uh, brain a little burst of serotonin. That serotonin feels good, and if you do it enough, it actually kind of makes your brain believe that it has, it has accomplished that goal. And because of that, you're gonna be a little bit less likely or potentially a lot less likely to actually go out and achieve that goal. So keep your experiment to yourself. Nowadays, um, I really don't talk a lot about what I'm doing uh, if it's not already established. It took me forever to decide I wanted to wear a, you know, a jiu-jitsu shirt just because um, I just didn't want people to know. So keep your experiment to yourself. So with these, if we kind of learn uh, to experiment, um, eventually we may kind of discover something that is, is worth learning for us. And when we find that, um, it kind of brings us to our next bullet point, our next principle, which is focus on mastery and not the milestone. So jujitsu is kind of unique in that about 99% of the people who start jujitsu jiu -jitsu, never actually earn their black belt. It's probably more than 99%. And the primary reason for this is it takes a long, long time to get a black belt in Jiu Jitsu. Um, in other martial arts like potentially Taekwondo or Judo, uh, you can earn with some dedicated practice, you could probably earn your black belt in about five years. Um, in, Jiu -Jitsu, in Jiu Jitsu, you're looking at probably a minimum of 10 years to get a black belt and potentially longer, um, probably more so like 15 years uh, or more. So for example, I've been training Jiu Jitsu for nine years and you know, if everything goes right, uh, I'm probably you know, four or five years away from getting a black belt. And that's if everything goes right. If I get injured and it keeps me out of the gym, that sets the clock back a little bit. If we have a global pandemic that keeps us out of the gym for a, an extended period of time, that sets the clock back. Um, so what's kind of crazy about uh, jujitsu as well is there's really no set path between belts. So in Taekwondo or Judo, for example. So in Judo, you go in and you get your white belt and they give you this list of things that you need to learn to get your yellow belt. And so you learn that list of things, you demonstrate that you know it, and they give you your, your yellow belt, and then they give you the list of things you need to do to earn your orange belt. And it goes like that until you eventually earn your black belt. In Jiu Jitsu, that's not the case. Um, in Jiu Jitsu, if you walk in and you say, you know, hey coach, what can I do? I'm a white belt, what can I do to get to my blue belt? Uh, the coach will say, well, you know, keep coming to practice, keep training hard. Uh, if you want to go compete, maybe win a couple competitions at white belt, that'll certainly help your chances of, of getting your blue belt faster. But other than that, you know, the main answer is just keep training. And since there's only five belts in Jiu Jitsu, there it goes white, blue, purple, brown, black. Um, it's not uncommon for someone to be training three to five years just to get their blue belt. So the same amount of time it would take someone in another martial art to get a black belt, someone in jiu-jitsu may only be getting their blue belt. And what's crazy is that a lot of times when people eventually get their blue belts, they end up quitting right after they get their blue belt. Um, Scott Thompson, who is our head black belt uh, for our jiu-jitsu family in Omaha, um, he likes to say that when he gives someone a, a, a blue belt, he feels like a magician because they oftentimes disappear, never to be seen from again. And that's just crazy. But the people who get their blue belt and leave, these are the people who are focused on the milestone and not mastery. They are focused on, on getting rank and achieving rank. And once they have that milestone in their hand, they think back about all the, the time and the effort and the pain that it took to get that blue belt. And then they look ahead in the future and they think about all the time and the effort and the pain it's gonna to take to get to purple and then to brown and then to black. And since they have that milestone, there's not enough motivation to keep going. And so, they quit. 
Um, on the other hand, the people who are focused on mastery, the people who are focused on actually getting good at jiu-jitsu and learning the art of jiu-jitsu and who, you know, appreciate the belts, but those are really just kind of stopping points or, or getting off points along the way. Those are the people who earn higher rank and those are the people that get really, really good at jiu-jitsu. So what does it look like to focus on mastery versus the milestone? Well, I think uh, a quote that kind of sums it up is a, a well-known quote by Bruce Lee. And that is, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, uh, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. So it's kind of a basic quote, but I think there's some, some really powerful lessons in there. If we think about a man who practices one kick 10,000 times, what does that tell us about him? Well, one of the things that tells us about him is that he probably enjoys kicking things. Can you imagine someone who who starts a martial art and kicks something maybe 100, 200 times and they're like, man, I really hate kicking stuff. And then they continue to kick things 10,000 times. I mean, that's just not gonna happen. Um, but what's kind of cool is this can actually be um, a metric for, for understanding that you're on the right path, right? If you find something that you enjoy practicing, um, you're very likely to become successful at that thing. Um, so with, uh, with Jiu Jitsu, I used to really uh, when someone left, when someone quit the gym, I would try really hard to try to get them back. Nowadays, you know, I might give them a call or two just to see if they're being lazy, but for the most part, I found the people that enjoy practice, that enjoy making time for jujitsu, they're going to do it. They're going to make the time, they're going to show up for practice, and these are the people who are going to continue and they're going to get promoted and they're going to get really good. The people who don't particularly enjoy the practice, eventually they're going to fade away and there's nothing that I can do about it. And that's okay, right? So. I would say this is, is, is kind of a powerful idea. Um, and I would even go on to say that your biggest successes will be found in the things that you enjoy practicing. Um, so how can we apply this to our life? Well, if you've got something that you're trying to learn, let's say you're trying to learn guitar and you just dread every time you have to pick up that guitar, here's a hint, you're probably not gonna become a good guitar player, right? Um, that, that's not to say that practice is going to be easy, like I said, jujitsu was hard, guitar was hard. But the thing about that was for me, it didn't matter. For me, I never dreaded going, going to practice. And in fact, I was constantly trying to find extra time to practice. Uh, I was try, uh, constantly trying to find extra times to get into the gym or extra times to pick up the guitar. Um, the things that I practice that I don't enjoy, uh, the practice are the things that I leave behind and that's okay because those are the things I'm probably never gonna be good at anyway. And what's cool is when we find something that we actually enjoy practicing, practice itself um, kind of becomes its own little thing. Uh, George Leonard uh, wrote a book called Mastery. Um, and he's got a quote in that book that I think kind of sums this up pretty nicely. Um, basically the idea of, of practice being something that's, that's just valuable in and of itself. He says, to practice regularly, even when you seem to be getting nowhere, might at first seem onerous. But the day eventually comes when practicing becomes a treasured part of your life. You settle into it as if into your favorite easy chair, unaware of time and turbulence of the world. It will still be there for you tomorrow. It will never go away. I think this is kind of especially poignant right now uh, where we are. Um, you know, it's never ideal being forced to be locked in our house and not being able to interact with humans. But for the people who have something that they enjoy practicing, it stings a little bit less. Um, I haven't really had to be quarantined and, and we're kind of lucky here in, in Nebraska that we haven't had to completely quarantine ourselves yet. Um, but if that happens, I've got about a dozen things that I'm looking forward to practicing at home because I have time, right? One of the biggest complaints we have when we're not suffering from a global pandemic is that we don't have enough time. Well, the biggest complaint I see on Facebook right now is people are bored because they've got too much time. If you had something to practice, you could actually make a use of that time and emerge from this whole ordeal stronger and better. Now, I will say I'm an introvert, so there's a ton of things that I love practicing at home. My wife is a, is a full blood extrovert, and so she's going crazy right now. I do have sympathy for extroverts who, you know, the things they enjoy practicing is getting out and seeing people and, and meeting new people and networking. So obviously this is it's a different story for, for different people. Um, and I have a lot of sympathy for extroverts stuck at home. Hopefully you can find something that you enjoy practicing at home. And I promise if you do find something like that, it's this whole thing is gonna sting a little bit less. So um, kind of transitioning back to jujitsu again. Um, we've said that jujitsu is a gentle art. Jujitsu is also known as human chess. 
Um, and then another kind of nickname for jujitsu jiu is a game of inches. So when you're thinking about fighting and and you know sports like that, it's hard to difficult. It's kind of difficult to think of it as a game of inches. But the more you get into jujitsu, the more that you learn, the more that you realize that yes, in fact, the difference between um, submitting someone and failing at a submission is literally sometimes an inch, potentially even a half an inch or less. Um, so there's a man named John Danaher. If you look at this picture, uh, he's this dude right here, the pale bald guy. Um, this is a picture of George St. Pierre when he won one of his recent um, uh, titles, uh, world titles in, in uh, the UFC. John Danaher is uh, one of the best jiu-jitsu coaches alive right now. Um, and he's got, so he's the head of what's called the Danaher Death Squad. Uh, the Danaher Death Squad is a group of jiu-jitsu athletes who are just tearing through the competitions. They're winning pretty much everything, and John is their coach. Well, John is also a, a, a philosopher. He was actually a philosophy major in, in college, so uh, he likes to look at the philosophy of jiu-jitsu, and he's got kind of a long quote here that uh, kind of explains what I was just talking about. He said, the sport of jiu-jitsu is one of the most technically demanding in all of sports. A submission that was 99% correct fails as badly as one that was 5% correct. There's a lot of heartache over moves that get close but fail. Interestingly, the cause of failure is usually something very small. That is why such a premium is put upon small technical details in jiu-jitsu, because they are the difference between almost winning but losing and winning. In a skill where there is only success and failure, and anything less than that complete success is failure, everything down to the smallest details has to be correct. So what does this have to do with anything? Well, basically, um, in jiu-jitsu, if you don't have a submission 100% correct, it doesn't matter how hard you try, it's not going to work, especially if you're rolling with someone of a higher level. It doesn't matter how hard you try, if that submission is not 100% correct, it's going to fail. So that brings us to principle five, the last principle of today, and that is working harder is not always the solution. So, um, so how can we use that? How can we use that in regular day, in everyday life? Well, basically, if if we're pushing and we're trying and we're trying hard and something is just not working, if something's just it's just failing constantly. If we just can't seem to find a way to make it work, well, it's potential. Uh, we're probably looking at it in the wrong way, and we need to get creative for it. Um, we need to find a creative solution. If we're constantly looking in one direction and trying this one thing over and over and over, and it's just failing, then we need to look in a different direction. And one example from my own life um, is music. So I've been playing music now in some form or another for 30 years, or more than 30 years. I probably started in second or third grade with the recorder, then I learned the trumpet and then the French horn and then, you know, guitar and I've been playing guitar forever. Well, the problem with, with music and with me specifically in music is I've always had difficulty uh, learning music theory. Uh, music theory is, is the study of how musical tones interact with each other. And music theory has kind of a language, a jargon of its own, the way that it's, it's kind of um, put together. And I have just never, ever been able to make sense. And this is despite my best efforts. I was a music major in college for a year trying to teach, uh, trying to learn music education. I've had multiple instructors. I've taken classes. I've watched videos. Um, you know, I've created uh, flashcards. I've read books. I've studied and studied and I tried and I tried and I tried. And at over 30 years, it has always, I've just always tended to fail at music theory. I've never been able to understand it the way I would like to understand it. And it was driving me crazy because everything else that I put my mind to, that I tried to achieve, that I wanted to achieve, I was able to achieve. And so I got thinking like, you know, is my learning just wrong? Did I start learning wrong in second and third grade? And because of that, like I've just ruined myself for learning music theory. I thought maybe is my brain wrong? Am I just not smart enough, intelligent enough to learn music theory? Um, and finally, kind of in a moment of, of, um, uh, of frustration, I finally just said, you know what? Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not the problem. Maybe the system sucks. And it kind of felt like an arrogant, ignorant thing to say, you know, oh, I'm not the problem. You're the problem. Well, uh, then I got to thinking about it and there's an author that I like to follow. Tim Ferriss is his name. He's pretty well known. He wrote, uh, the four hour work week and the four hour body and, and several other podcasts. And he's very keen on learning new things. And he's got a question that he likes to ask himself when he's learning something new. And that is, what would this look like if it were easy? So once again, what would this look like if 
it were easy. Well, um, I started looking at music theory and asking myself, what would this look like if it were easy? And so to kind of give you an idea of, of the process that I went through to figure this out, I'm going to show you just a little bit of music theory to, to help you understand. So this is the chromatic scale. The chromatic scale is basically all of the notes that we uh, that make up the music that we know and love. So basically every song you've ever heard is composed of these notes in this circle. But what's kind of crazy is it's alphabetical, but it starts on C. Why would you make something alphabetical and start it on C? I don't know. Um, then if you look over here, there's uh, this is this pound sign is a sharp and that like lowercase b is a flat. So C sharp and D flat, it's actually the same note. So the same note has two different names and depending on the situation, you have to call it by a different name. So then we move around, same with D sharp and E flat, same note, two different names. Well, then we get to E and F. What about E sharp? Well, there's no such thing. There's no E sharp. Why? I don't know. Because E sharp is the same as F and F flat is the same as E. The same rule applies to B and C. There's no B sharp or there's no C flat because B sharp is C and, and C flat is B, right? You can tell that this is just difficult, right? And, and so, there's people that understand that, but for the most part, there are plenty of musicians. Most of the musicians that I know uh, have a hard time with music theory. So I started thinking to myself, what would this look like if it were easy? And uh, what I came up with is, is basically, why do we have letters attached to this? Basically 12 tones. This is, believe it or not, this is only 12 tones and 12 tones and 12 notes make up all the music that we know. Um, and so I thought, well, why not just use numbers? And so 12 numbers in a circle, what does that look like? Well, it looks like a clock. Uh, and all of a sudden, this started making more sense to me. And all this work that I'd done in the past, pounding my head against the wall, thinking that I wasn't good enough, all of a sudden, it kind of disappeared when I realized that I could make it simpler. Um, and so now, based on this model, um, I've been able to understand music theory in a way that I've never been able to understand in the past. Um, it, I, I can't even state how much, how big of a deal it is for me. Um, so now, A sharp and B flat, it's not two different notes. It's, it's two. It's the number two, right? It's the same thing. Why have two names for the same thing? A is the first note because A is the first note of the alphabet. Everybody knows that. Uh, I, it doesn't matter that there's a strange gap between B and C because it's just three and four, and it will always be that case. So I don't know if this makes any sense or if it would help anybody. Um, I, I, it made so much sense to me that I ended up writing a book on it. Um, and uh, like, I don't know. I don't know if it'll help anybody else, but the book is out there and I'm going to give you some information at the end of this talk where if you think this sounds like something that you're interested in, I'll actually send you the book. I'll send you the PDF for free. Um, I don't know if it'll help anybody else, but if it can, man, I'd love to help someone else with it. So, um, what about other areas of our life, right? We're talking about wellness here. We're in a yoga studio. We're talking about wellness. What other areas do we typically see, do I see as a personal trainer, as a coach, where people are constantly making mistakes, they're constantly pushing and pushing and pushing and working so hard and still failing? Well, fitness, fitness is one. Um, you know, how's your fitness regimen working out for you? You know, is it, does it work well? Is it poor? Does it work poorly? Is it non-existent? Um, so many people think that fitness is going to the gym or going and doing CrossFit or running. Well, fitness is just activity. And if you can find an activity that you enjoy doing, you're well on your way to fitness. And so don't feel that fitness has to be going to the gym or going to CrossFit. Fitness can be going to a dance class. It can be walking your dog. It can be hiking in the mountains, right? It can be any number of things. And when you find the thing, once again, if we talk about mastery versus the milestone, if you find the thing that you enjoy practicing, if you find the activity that you enjoy doing, you're gonna be so much more likely to be successful with it. What about nutrition, right? There's so many complicated diets. Uh, there's keto and there's paleo and they have all these specific rules and there's things you can do and things you can't do. And you know, uh, as a personal trainer, I'll tell you this, the more complicated the diet is, the less likely you're gonna, you're gonna be to stick to it. You've gotta find a diet that fits into your life. Uh, for example, in my life, um, I have never liked eating breakfast. Uh, it's one of those things where I tried to force myself because it was supposed to be the healthiest meal or the most important meal of the day, uh, but I didn't like to do it and I always felt guilty when I skipped. Um, but then along came intermittent fasting and all of a sudden, uh, skipping meals wasn't a big deal. It was healthy actually to skip breakfast and, and not uh, and eat your first meal as lunch. And so I'm thinking, man, this is awesome. Uh, it fits into my life. It's what works for me and it's what I'm able to maintain. So if you have an area of your life that's difficult, that you just can't seem to find any foothold, you can't seem to find any progress, 
you know, step back, look at it, examine it, think, what would this look like if it were easy? Uh, and then make the necessary adjustments. You don't have to do it the same way that everybody else does it. Uh, you're a unique per person and you're gonna have unique solutions to your own problems. I mean, I'm arrogant enough to think that I can change music theory. I, you, can, you can change your, your fitness, you can change your nutrition regimen, you can change pretty much anything that you have uh, uh, in your life that you wanna change. So, kind of thinking back to jiu-jitsu, um, we mentioned towards the beginning that jiu-jitsu is, is a, a means of self-defense. Well. With the principles that I've covered tonight, uh, I think that I kind of think of these principles as self-defense for the mind. Um, in talking with Navy SEALs and in uh, reading a butch, bunch of books on Navy SEALs, what you'll find is uh, they all agree that the body itself is very resilient. The mind is one of the weakest things. The mind breaks far before, long before the body ever breaks. Uh, the, the, the recruits that go through BUDS and the, who go through Hell Week, it's generally not their body that breaks, it's their mind that tells them that they can't keep going. Um, and so if we can do things to strengthen our mind, uh, we are going to be above the game, right? If we can get our minds to where we can kind of um, operate at the same level as our body, if we can develop the same strength in our mind as we have in our body, or even stronger, a stronger mind than our body, um, the 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 boundaries are limitless. Like think of Stephen, Stephen Hawking, right? His body was broken. He was in a wheelchair. He couldn't, literally couldn't talk. And he was one of the most brilliant minds that our, our, our universe ever saw. So fix your mind. Uh, this is self-defense for your mind, right? Develop a growth mindset. When you, when you decide that you can overcome whatever you want to put before you, it's almost like developing a superpower. When you, when you realize that you can undertake challenges and overcome and you're not afraid to undertake challenges, it's a superpower. You're going to, you're going to accomplish things that you never thought you'd be able to accomplish. When you invest in failure, when you realize that failure isn't the end of the road, it's the beginning of a new one, there's so much that you can do. It's kind of like the Hulk, right? The Hulk from the comics. Every, you know, the, the Hulk gets, the angrier he gets, the stronger he gets, and right? The same thing can kind of be for us. The more we fail, the more we can learn. Um, so don't be afraid to fail and, and learn from your failures. Experiment, right? Find different ways to fail. Find creative ways to fail. You're gonna grow, you're gonna get stronger, you're gonna learn more from it. Um, focus on mastery and not the milestone. There's so many ways that we, we can seek out rewards and, and we can look for monetary, we can look for relationships and, and we can look for all different types of rewards. But when we focus on mastery, when we focus on finding something that we enjoy practicing, that's where we're going to find our success, not only in the milestones that we achieve, but just in the, the enjoyment that we get out of practicing and, and striving for mastery in everything that we do. And then finally, working harder is not always the solution. Try to get creative. It's, if something's not working, try to find a different way to do it. Okay. Um, that's about all I have for you today. Um, we can do some questions. I know Ginger is watching from, uh, from the live feed. So if there, anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, if you're interested, if you like what I had to say today, if you want some more, uh, if you're interested in keeping up with music, my website is joshkidney.com. Um, if you're interested in any of the books that I've written, email me at joshkidney at gmail.com. I'll send them to you for free. Not interested in making money right now. Um, I'm hoping actually, if I have time and if we are quarantined, I'm hoping that I can record audio versions of my kids' books so that hopefully if you've got kids that are looking for something to do, um, they can listen to my kids' books, hopefully maybe as soon as the end of next week. We'll see if I have the time. Um, but email me at joshkidney at gmail.com. And then remember to donate uh, at Fremont, Fremont Blue Yoga at gmail.com. They're, they're setting up a scholarship fund. So all your money uh, goes to, to, to help put on events like this. So if you like what we've done here uh, and you want to see more of it happen, um, it's a great organization to, to support. So that's what I've got. Do we have any questions? Do you guys have any questions? Don't have a ton of people watching, but that's okay. We'll go ahead and make this, uh, I think we can make this available to watch. Um, so I'm hoping I can put it on my website and we can put it on other, other places for people to tune in uh, and check it out uh, after the fact. So if you stuck with me this long, thank you so much for, for uh, joining me. Um, and for, for paying attention, that, that says a lot. There's a lot of distractions in the world today for sitting here for an hour listening to a guy talk about a martial art that you probably don't even care about. Uh, it says a lot about you. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Ginger. Thank you to Blue Yoga for having me. And uh, 
I hope uh, we can all emerge from this quarantine and from this um, pandemic a little bit stronger and more connected. So thank you very much.